welcome everyone tonight to the uh, Bible study. We're going to consider a, a couple of questions here that are interesting questions. And I think it's questions that are very appropriate for all of us, especially in the times that we're living now. Before we begin, we're going to open with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for everything you have given us. We thank you for your sweet Holy Spirit. Yes, Father. We pray, Father, that as we peer into your word, yes, Lord and we study your word on these yes, various yes, topics, yes, that we will understand your mind, yes, that we will embrace it, that we will allow it to mold into our thinking yes, so that we can have the mind of Christ. We pray, Father, that you will indeed bless us and help us and where there's areas where we need to improve, help us to improve. Help us to do what we need to do to bring honor and praise to you. Yes, bless this study. Bless us, Father, in everything that we do. And I pray, Father, for those who may be listening in, that you will give them an attentive ear yes, and an attentive you. heart, that they too may be benefited and blessed by yes, it. Yes, we love you. We thank you. We give you the glory. We give you the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So we're going to begin with uh, talking about something that, re re regardless of who you are, <coughs> here in America, you hate it, and that's paying taxes. Uh, there's a certain group of political party who likes to tax you, but the leaders of that party don't themselves want to be taxed, you know? <laughs> And then you have people who will go to great extremes to avoid paying taxes, putting their their money in offshore bank accounts, and uh, you know doing things in other ways. They, they they do what they can to avoid paying what may be their just due. Well, we're going to look into the scriptures and see what biblical mandates we have regarding that. We're also going to talk a little bit more about. Uh, submission to government, and then we're going to uh, go into the, you could say, the government of the church. Um, but to begin with, we're going to read Romans chapter 13 and verse number 7. Romans chapter 13, verse 7. The question should Christians pay all taxes and assessments honestly by law? I think the key word there is honestly. Romans 13, verse 7. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Okay. Now, if you look at the context of this, last week we talked about Romans 13, 1 where we're to be in subjection to the rulers. And we talked about the various facets of that. And then now we're here told that we are to render, therefore, to all their dues. To all. What does that mean? <coughs> Do we just pay one tax? <coughs> federal and state. You got federal, you have state. You have local. You have local county. Local. Sales. Okay, we're going to get into that in just a second. But yeah, you got, uh, uh, back in the days of Rome, you, you had various princes you had to pay taxes to, you know, sons of the emperors. You had magistrates, you had officers that you had to pay taxes to. And likewise, today we have, uh, you know, we have county taxes, state taxes, federal taxes. Uh, if we're in business, we have taxes, you know. Corporations have taxes. You know, if, if it moves, they're going to tax it. If it's dead, they're going to tax it. Okay? I mean, unfortunately, that's how it is. And we live in the state of tax heaven. For those who love taxes, move to California. Okay? Romans 13, 7 says here, to all their dues. So the county has a due. The state has a due. The federal government has a due. Um, and then it says tribute to whom tribute. What do you think this tribute meant? This is a tax too, but what kind of tax do you think it might be? Welfare? No. Well, they may take uh, uh, money from this to pay it for welfare. 
primarily, this is what uh, you could say pays for the for us today, the fire department, the schools. Who's what taxes do we pay that pays for those services? Well, that's on our homeowners. Property tax. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's what it's talking about here: property, land, estate taxes, um, even poll taxes. Okay, all of that is tribute to tribute, and then it, it even goes a step further and says custom to custom. Now we use the word customs in the airport. What are you doing regarding customs in the airport? If you're if you're gonna go to Fiji and you're gonna bring back a box of mangoes, you gotta take it through customs. Why? For sure. So they can get in your luggage. Right, but what are they gonna? What what are what's the the the, the that weird one what is Fiji gonna to probably do because you're taking a box of mangoes? Like or tax. Or, or when you come to the airport in Los Angeles, they, you might have to pay a, something for that. Sure. that you, yeah, Whoa. yeah, you're right. It, it would be, uh, it would be a, in a form tariffs, yeah. But it, this has to do uh, custom to custom is um, like what I just said, merchandise tax, uh, revenue uh, collection. Um, all kinds of taxes involving that sales tax International tax. right okay that would be the custom to custom so you know Paul kind of left this wide open and said hey it's all whether you having to pay the king the prince the whoever whether you're having to pay for your property tax whether you having to when you barter and exchange and you're having to pay some kind of tax for that Mm -hmm. And even revenue. Mm -hmm. Well, aren't, don't we have all of those here in America? <coughs> Absolutely. Okay? But he says, render therefore to all their dues. And then he, he breaks it down. But then he says, after he talks about what type of dues they may be, he says, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Now, what do you think it means when it says here, fear to whom fear? Respect who do respect. Respect, exactly. Respect the office. Now, even though the people that have these offices may, they, may very well be very crooked, dishonest, and thieves, is the fact that the tax collector, a thief, give us a free ticket to say, I'm not paying taxes and I don't have to pay taxes? No. No. Because, again, their accountability will go to who? God. Okay, if they're not doing their job right and they're being a thief because of it, they'll hold an accountability for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that's not up to us to be part of that judgment. That's God's judgment, not our judgment. We still have our obligation and we still have what we must do. And then it says, honor to whom honor. Again, this goes back to what we just said, respecting the office, honoring the office. There is no distinction between good and bad government. It's not right to completely try to pull down the government if we think that it's bad. Now there are people out here who are, you know, they go and they, they riot and they protest and they, they go, oh, the government did this and they, they did that and they go and they they destroy government buildings. They vandalize government property. They do all these things. There's even been religious leaders here in America who got involved in political activism and people lost their lives over it. You think God is well pleased with that type of behavior? No, it, it, it doesn't matter what they may be protesting about. We were told, regardless, we still do honor to honor. We still honor the government that we are a part of, or I should say that we fall under. <clears throat> okay, now the question is, why? Why should we honor the government? Why would God insist that we pay taxes or tributes or customs to these governments? Why? Well, there's three good reasons. Number one, if you read Romans chapter... 13 and you read the first seven verses 
It talked about the wrath of the superior authorities, the wrath of the government. You know, it's in the power of the government to persecute Christians. It's in the power of the government for to take away Christian rights. It's, a, it's in the power of the government to make life difficult for Christians. It is, a, it is in the, the government's... Uh, they have the power to put Christians to death. So, it, are these somebody that we want to upset? Are these people the ones that we would want to, to get on their bad side? If right now we have freedom, if right now we have what we have, even in, here in America, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, you know, churches fall under a 501c3 status where we get tax, uh, the freedom to not have to pay tax on our revenue. The collections and donations that come into churches, if you're a 501c3, you don't have to pay taxes on that revenue. The buildings that the churches own, they do not have to pay property tax on it. Do you realize right now that if the government were to change that stance, how much taxes, property tax, do you think the Catholic Church would have to pay in America? There would be no more church, Catholic churches. It would wipe them out. That's just one example, right? But there's even big Protestant denominations that own huge amounts of property. If they were paying property tax on that property, now not to mention, not just for the property, but here they built a $3 million structure, and you have to pay taxes on the value of that structure as well. Do, do you think that you think the preachers are bad now for begging for money? Mm -hmm. If they were paying taxes on their revenue and what they had and what they were collected and kept and what they had in the bank, mm -hmm. do you think they would stay open for long? Probably not. And it's been always in my field of, of things, you know, many of us, realize that as we get closer to the end of time that the churches are going to come under a great a great amount of, of, of pressure of persecution we're in the age of persecution but when we get to the very end you know the persecution is going to be a lot worse than what it is now right mm -hmm. well when that happens I think the number one way that the government will get rid of the church is to start taxing the churches mm -hmm. That'll be how they clear, wipe, wipe the churches out. Now here we, the true people of God, we're not worried if they take a building. We're not worried if they take a piece of property. For one, our ministry don't have that yet. But even if we did, we're not worried. You know why? Because as I've preached and preached and preached about from our pulpit, our church is not the building. Right. Our church is us. So whether we take turns being in each other's homes, whether we divide up into three or four groups and have church at the same time in three or four homes, yeah. we could use the, the device we're using now and, and live stream to where other groups and other homes could be watching. We don't need a building <coughs> to serve God. I mean, look at all the land up around California. We could find a big old uh, field or valley to, to congregate in if we have to. Might not be as comfortable, but we don't have to have a building if it ever were to get to that point. Now, we might not be able to do it in an open public if we're under persecution and we've been and our work has been banned, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes as well. But the point is, we don't put our faith, we don't put our our trust in what we as a congregation has physically and monetarily. <laughs> That is what we do not do. Because it's not about how much the church has in a bank account. It's how much faith does the church have. Because it's faith is what's going to save us, not the money. Mm -hmm. right. There was a church that I knew of where they kept $40,000 in their funds at all times. And whenever they would get under $40,000, you knew they were under $40,000 because for a week or two, that's all the pastor would preach about was needing more money. Now here you got $39,000 and you're begging for money because you need the 40. They were putting faith in having that cap. Well, if the government were to seize all that the churches have, that means the government, if our money's in the bank, the government may seize it and we can't get it anyway. Mm -hmm. Right? 
if we put our faith in that, then when that if that would ever happen, guess what? We've lost all our faith. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Our faith does not fold up and go into our wads. Right. Yeah. Our faith is in our heart and it's in our actions and it's in what we believe, what we teach, what we do, what we it's in everything that we are about. That's where our true faith lies. Mm -hmm, yeah. And so that's what we need to keep in mind. And so Paul is here saying, you know, you got the wrath of the superior authorities. You need to respect them because you may get freedom longer if you respect them. Okay? Another reason why Paul said it was necessary to pay taxes and, 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 and to show this respect is because when we do things honestly and we do what we know is our just due, what do we have? A clean what? Conscience, that's for sure. You know, there was a, a when I was a teenager, there was a billboard, and I don't even know what it represented or what it was advertising, but there was a there was a, a billboard. It might have even been a church that had it. It said, "A clean conscience is a soft pillow." That's exactly right. <laughs> you know, you can go to bed at night knowing, okay, I've done everything. I don't have to worry about anything. That's right. You know how you, you see people that. They get all these uh, credit card companies calling them because they haven't paid the bill. Mm -hmm. Every time the phone rings, they get this fear that comes on them. Who's mm -hmm. this? Oh, if it's unavailable, if it's this, if it's that, if it's private, I'm not answering because it might be a bill collector. Right. I haven't spoken to anybody in four <laughs> years, and if I answer the phone now, all that starts over, and for the next seven years, they're going to be harassing me again. Because everybody in America knows after seven years the statute of limitations is up and people do not pay their debts. They dodge the bullet for seven years, those that don't file bankruptcy. Well, when we are doing what we know we have to do with our taxes, what we're doing, what we have to do with what we owe, we don't worry about any of that. Right. You don't even have to look at your phone when you answer it. Because you're free. You got a clean conscience. You're not scared. You're not worried. Oh, they might levy my check. They might do this. They might do that. You're not worried because you know that you've, you've paid your dues. So that's another reason. And the third reason is we need to pay these public servants for providing the services that they are offering us. Aren't we glad? Now, I know we live in a pothole state, but aren't we glad we got paved roads? <laughs> Aren't, even though we got potholes and we have to dodge them, aren't we glad we have paved roads? Yeah. Aren't we glad that we have a fire station down the street that if something happens, they're probably going to be here within two or three minutes? Not ours. This guy will get water first. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and they're coming. In your case, you've got a fire station down the street, but yet North Highlands are the one that bring you. <laughs> but aren't we happy, though, that, that there is police? They may not come when you want them, but at least we know they're there and that they, they're they going to be coming even though Grandma, you know, passed out or, or, or somebody got shot two hours ago. We know they're coming, okay? These are, aren't we glad that, uh, now, most, all of us here tonight put our children in Christian schools, but for those who aren't blessed to be able to do that, they're thankful that we have a government that provides public education. Our children, those children are at least getting something. It may not be the best, and it may not be turning them toward God, but at least they're, they're learning basics that they need to know for survival. Mm -hmm. You know, basic uh, reading, reading writing. writing, and arithmetic. Mm -hmm. Right? So, you know, so we need to do our part. Uh, when we pay our taxes, it helps pay for these services. And... Um, that's why Paul said, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which be... Oh, I'm in another verse. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but that's why Paul said that we render therefore to all their dues. Mm -hmm. They might be crooked. They might be stealing off the top. <laughs> you can't tell me that a congressman that goes into Congress with $1,000 in the bank and, and 25 years later is worth $50 million that they're not stealing something. Shady There's something that's not right, not on the salary that the congressmen get. Um, even though we know that, for the 
betterment of most of the society, these services are there, and we're thankful for that. And we need to do our part to show our respect. Now, let's look in the words of Jesus. This is the master genius. Jesus could analyze a situation, and he always had the best answer. He always had the best answer for anything that came up, even when he was being entrapped. Luke chapter 20, verse 21 to 25. <clears throat> Anyone jump in? Then they are 21, right? Yeah, then 21. they asked him, saying, "Teacher, we know that you say, we know that you say and teach rightly, and you do not show personal favoritism, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful for us to to pay taxes to Caesar or not?" But he perceived their craftiness and said to them, "Why do you test me? Show me your denarii, whose image and inscription does it have?" They answered and said, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Okay. Let's look at context. Who came up to Jesus and asked him this question? The Pharisees. Who were the Pharisees? The Pharisees. <laughs> the Pharisees. <laughs> The free, the, well, the oh yeah, the Sanhedrin, not the Sanhedrin. Well, they were the, the, the yeah, they were the leaders, <coughs> the religious <laughs> leaders. Now, you had the priests that were in the temple that were not the Pharisees. The Pharisees were basically the experts of the law. They were all the lawyers of the Jewish society who walked around, and when they wanted, they were, they were like the legislatures. When they wanted to change the laws or they wanted to interpret it differently, they met together in the Sanhedrin, and they did their thing. And they walked around, you know, with their arrogance and their pride. And, you know, the Sadducees was another group that was similar to the Pharisees. Uh, but the biggest difference between a Pharisee and a Sadducee is a Sadducee did not believe in any kind of resurrection. The Pharisees did. So even in their own factions, there were those who had certain religious beliefs and those who didn't. But the Sadducee, that's why they were called Sadducee. Because they didn't believe in the resurrection. <laughs> right. You know, so, but, but the Pharisees were the primary ones who were the attackers of Jesus. They always tried to attack his character. They, they're the ones who incited Rome to have Jesus crucified. Now, they're asking, they're, they're going up to him, and you know, you know what master, the term master meant? Were they submitting to Jesus as he was a master over them? What, and, and even in the Indian culture, what's a master called? Uh, at, at the church, Jack Beach, what they called a master. Why did they call him master? He's a, teacher. He's a teacher. In many cultures, that's what they call a teacher, is master. And so, or rabbi, you could say rabbi as well. So here, they're kind of giving him a title. They're kind of trying to give him flattery. It's just like if I knew someone who was an uh, atheist that come in here, and all of a sudden, with great humility, they come to me and say, Pastor, I know you have the answer. I know that you, you, you have studied. I know that you always give the best answers. I have a question for you. Now, first of all, they don't believe. And now they're coming up to me. And, you know, using a title that those that respect me call me, right? I would have question, why are they cut? Normally they'd come in here and say, hey, Jay, blah, 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 you know. Why are they calling me pastor now when they don't believe? Mm -hmm. Right? That's what Jesus, he, he, with his discernment, he knew that. He saw it. He knew that they were trying to do something. So they come up and they say, we have a question, Master. You, In fact, they really take this flattery to a whole nother level. And you see their hypocrisy in how they ask it. We know that thou sayest and teachest rightly, neither accepted thou the person of any, but teaches the way of God truly. 
Like, there's nobody like you in the way you teach. And here they are, teachers themselves. Now, do you think these teachers wanted to really hear the teachings of this great teacher? Absolutely not. So Jesus knew, and that's what it says here. He knew before he answered. He, he said that they, he knew that they had, uh, he perceived their craftiness. Matthew said he perceived their wickedness. In Mark's account of this story, Mark said he perceived their hypocrisy. Okay? <laughs> so we can look at all these words and get a clear picture of what Jesus saw and what he knew. But what was the question? Is it lawful for us to give tribute unto Caesar or no? Now, they're teachers of the law. They're Pharisees. They're lawyers. Don't you think they know the answer to this question? Why are they asking it? The traffic. Because they're hoping he's going to say something that they can go back and tell Rome he's, he's being treasonous. Mm -hmm. He just told the people not to pay your taxes. You know? He, he knew that, that they were being, you know... Facetious. Facetious. Okay, now here's the th deal. Did the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders have a good relationship with the Roman leaders? No. They hated them. The Jews hated the Rome. They resented the fact that they had set up their providence right there amongst them. They hated it, absolutely. If you were to ask a Pharisee the same question, what would a Pharisee most likely answer? No, you don't pay in taxes because they have no right to come in here and take over our area. Oh. It's interesting that the very answer that they would have given, they're trying to get Jesus to answer it too so that they can entrap them. Wait a minute. Does that sound familiar with what's going on on the news right now? Yeah. <laughs> the very thing that certain uh, political leaders right now are being accused of, the ones that are accusing them are the ones that are doing those things. The accusers always mm -hmm. appear. Okay? And that's exactly what we have here. The Pharisees are trying to, you know, to entrap Jesus with an answer that they, that they can go back and now have Rome put him in jail. Or even maybe even crucify him then. But what was Jesus' answer? What was his answer? Render to Caesar what is Caesar's? Even before that, though. Oh. What did he uh, tell him to go do? To look at the dairy. And, or, he's show asking me, if he was yeah. being tested, and then he says, show me the money, right. Yeah, show go me give money. me a penny. Go, go, go get one of your silver pennies. Now, that silver pennies value today would be about the value of one half of our penny. Okay? <laughs> but he said, go get, a, go get one of those silver pennies. Bring it out of here. And they brought it. And he said, whose inscription, whose head is on this, on, the, on this coin? They said Caesar's. Well, no doubt it was Tiberius Caesar because he was the emperor of that time. And so what was his answer, Bonnie? Render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Now, why would it be necessary? Why do you think that you would need to give Caesar anything? Because you're using his coin in, his land. in order to purchase the things that you need. Mm -hmm. You need to purchase and barter for food. You're using his coin. When you go to work and, and, and you getting that coin, that, those coins that are allowing you to have your home and allowing you to do what you're doing, you need those coins. Mm -hmm. they, need it. They, needed to have, they needed to have money uh, to buy the... The, the fabric for them to make their clothes. They needed the money for food. They needed the money just like we need the money for. So since you're using his coin and his currency, you need to render to Caesar what's, what you need to render. Because it costs money to make that coin. Right? right? You need to give Caesar what's, what, what's due his. However... What was the other part? Render to God what is God's. Render to God what is God's. Now it's interesting. I don't have a... Does anybody have a penny? Mm -mm. I don't have a coin. <laughs> I'm going to use this piece of cheesecake. Yeah, and then I'll have a good reason to eat it afterward, right? 
I look at this. Paul, don't mess up my vibe. <laughs> He's looking both <laughs> Okay, I look at this, and there's a there's a there's an inscription. There there's a there's a, a head. Okay, it's Caesar. What that represents, the fact that Caesar was stamped on this coin, is he exercised his sovereignty by putting his head on this coin. Because this coin is used for currency, for trading, and for, for, for all kinds of different purposes. This is Caesar's coin. But when you look at us, whose inscription is on us? We were made in his image. When you look at man, we were made in the likeness of God. We were, we're in his image. We're in his likeness. And he has a sovereignty over us. Rendering to God what is God's could be in a monetary way, but it could, it, it could also have reference to spiritual. Our time, our devotion, our relationship with him, our prayers, our studying the word, all the things that we do, going to, to, to church, all the things, doing benevolence for the sick and for the needy. All those things is rendering to God's what is God. He made us to be his hands and, and his feet. And especially using our mouth to praise him. Using our mouth to bring people to him. We got all this knowledge trapped in our bodies, in our heads, hopefully in our hearts. But yet we don't ever, ever talk about God to those we work with or those in some of our families or, or those of our neighbors. We don't ever say a word. You mind your business, I mind mine. And it... There was a poem, I don't have it. If I thought that I was going to talk about it, I would have printed it out and read it to you. But the, te the, the, the poem is, You Were My Friend. The McCamies one time had it in a song. Uh, you never, what was that song? You never mentioned him to me was the name of the song. But in that, in that poem, You Were My Friend, it's a, it, you got your best friend here. And now it's judgment day. You're going to heaven and he's going to hell. Mm -hmm. And your best friend is looking at you saying, you knew. You knew. Why didn't you get me in? Why didn't you talk to me about it? Why didn't, even though I was stubborn, why didn't you keep on? If you really loved me and you was really my friend, you wouldn't have let go until I would have accepted what you have accepted. And that's what the whole poem's about. You were my friend. I can't call you friend now because I'm going to eternal death. You're going to eternal life. But because you didn't say something, because you didn't have interest, enough interest in me to convince me, now I'm going to hell. Here it is. My friend, I stand in judgment now and feel that you're to blame somehow. While on this earth, I walked with you day by day and never did you point the way. You knew the Lord, the Lord in truth and glory, but never did you tell the, me the story. My knowledge then was very dim. You could have led me safely to him. Though we lived together here on earth, you never told me of your second birth. And now I stand this day condemned because you failed to mention him. You taught me many things, that's true. I called you friend and trusted you. But now I learned, now it's too late. You could have kept me from this fate. We walked by day and talked by night, and yet you showed me not the light. You let me live, love, and die, and all the while you knew I'd never live on high. Yes, I called you friend in life and trusted you in joy and strife. Yet in coming to my end, I see you really weren't my friend. That's powerful. But see, that's, that's what we need to do. Use our mouths to praise God and bring people to Him. That is part of rendering to God what is God's. 
Now, some will say, yeah, well, it also means your tithes and offerings. Well, yeah, in part it does. But I'm, not, I'm concentrating more on the spiritual part of it. Because if you don't have that spiritual foundation first, any monetary thing you do for God really is in vain. Because it's not about the money. It's about what you believe in your faith first. And then that faith is going to move you to do something monetarily. Okay, number eight. We're going into another question. The question is, are there circumstances where Christians would not obey the government? Acts chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. Acts chapter 4, 18 through 20. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the context of this? We should know this because the very next verse is the theme of our ministry. Acts 4.21. Or 4.31. I'm sorry. <laughs> Duh. Acts 4. Well, you know, you, you know better than I do. What was the context of the, of the theme of our ministry? Acts 4.31. Where was the apostles and the disciples, Peter, John, and James? Where were they whenever they spoke those words? They were standing before who? Well, I'll give you a hint. In verse 18, it says, They called them and commanded them not to speak. Who had the authority to tell them they couldn't speak? Just the Pharisees. Okay. Even more so. The Pharisees still had to submit to who? The Romans. The Romans. The Romans. They were before the governor. Okay? They were before the political factions of their day. Okay? And because the Pharisees were, were getting so, as they used to say, you're getting your panties in a wad. <laughs> Because they were acting like that and getting so upset because the apostles were performing miracles and all this buzz was going about, they thought they had gotten rid of Jesus and now they're hearing more about Jesus now that he's dead than he was when he was living. So the Pharisees go before Rome, the government, and they tell, hey, you've got to do something. We're, we've got chaos down here. So they were ordered. They were ordered to do what? Keep your mouth shut. This Jesus thing, you need to let it go. Je your Jesus is gone. <laughs> Unfortunately for them, Jesus was more alive than he was dead. He was more alive now that he was in heaven than he was when he was on earth because now, through the Spirit, he was everywhere, not just in one place at a time. Okay? And so what was going on here? They were ordered, do not speak, do not teach in the name of Jesus. You, you, you can go out here and speak and teach, but don't use that name anymore. But what was it that Jesus said his disciples needed to do? If you're going to have power, and you're going to have works, and you're going to do these things, you got to do it in my name. You do it in my name, and it will be given. When we say in his name, we're talking about his authority. But there is authority. You, you're commanding authority when you use and pronounce that beautiful name, Jesus. Jesus. That is authority that cannot be touched. Mm -hmm. And they were using that name. And it was going forth. And everybody, no, 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 Jesus, no, 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 Jesus, no, no, no. Everywhere you went, you heard Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And you know what? In some respects, it hasn't changed. 
There's somewhere around the world all the time where there's somebody, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Somewhere around the world, you know, like that old song, there's five o'clock somewhere. Mm -hmm. Somewhere around the world at all times, even when we're sleeping, somewhere else there's somebody praising Jesus. That's right. There's somebody witnessing in behalf of Jesus. There's somebody doing something powerful in the name of Jesus. It's going, or that praise is going forward 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Creation, the sunrise, the sunset, the beauty, mar marvelous rainbows, the, the stars that we see, the, the, the creation is declaring the glory of God. They're declaring the works of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do it, guess what? He said, I'll make the, the rocks, rocks do it. The rocks right. will cry out and do it. So here they were being told, uh-uh, you can't do that no more. Shh. Shh. <laughs> now, my question is, well, couldn't they have been Christians that just didn't go around and talk about stuff? I mean, couldn't they have, let's go home, we're going to we're gonna go to our house and we're going to praise the name of the Lord inside our house. We're going to have a group come over and boy, we're gonna, there's going to be so much praise. We don't need to go out here in the public and do this. Could they have done that? Think about it though. What was their commission? What is the great commission? To go to the ends of the world. Guess what? Jesus said you can't just do it in private. Mm -hmm. Jesus said you're going to have to go public. Yeah. Yeah. And that command is still val valid today. That's right. it, We're not just supposed to do what we do inside our house in front of a few people. We're supposed to go forward and declare. Mm -hmm. And once we get more established, if we go to Thailand and help toys ministry, if we go to Africa and help uh, Kathleen's ministry, wherever we may go, we're going forward. We're going public. We're going international. We're not supposed to contain it to ourselves and keep it inside. Our commission was to go. And our commission also was to do what? Make disciples. It's not about keeping a club or a small private group. It's about growth. Not to get numbers into an organization, but getting numbers, more numbers into the fold of salvation. And that's what it's about. Saving souls. Jesus also said, Matthew 5, 16. I, I quote it quite a bit. Let your light so shine. Shine. Mm -hmm. And then he even took it a step further and said, don't put it under a basket. If we go in our house and just praise God in our house and that's it, we're putting it under a basket. See, the, the apostles knew what the Great Commission meant. They knew what their objective was as ministers of the gospel. They knew what it meant to be a real disciple of Jesus. Did Jesus stay in one place? No. For three and a half years, you know how many miles Jesus walked? Now don't tell me how I figured this out, and I can't even remember how I did it, but what I did when I was in college... <laughs> I went and I looked at all the places from the Gospels that it said Jesus went to. Okay? He was in Capernaum. He went to Nazareth. He went to Galilee. He did this. He did this. He did this. And I took a scale map and I tried to do to the best of my ability how far all the places Jesus went. And he, he went to several cities three or four times. In three and a half years... It's estimated that Jesus walked almost 700 miles. Oh, wow. He didn't stay in one place, and he didn't stay private. And he commissioned us to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. He commissioned us to do the same thing. So that's something. The disciples knew that, and when they were ordered, keep your mouth shut, they weren't having it. In fact, let's look at our next scripture, Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Acts chapter 5, verse 29. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, 
we ought to obey God rather than man. Wow. Men. What was their answer? We must obey God rather than men. <coughs> hey. Well, huh. go. Yeah, I don't care. What, we don't care what you say. You ain't going to stop us. You can kill us. You killed Jesus, but did it stop Jesus' word? Did it stop his message? No. You can kill us, but this Jesus message is not going to stop because you get rid of me. So do what you got to do. But we're not going to let you stop us from being obedient to God. Hmm? What's that? She wants a what? Oh, not right now, boo-boo. <laughs> so, in fact, this word ought, we ought to obey. Ought is an, an old past form of the verb owe. I don't know if you knew that. O. O W E. What we ought to do, we owe to do. What we ought to be, we are owed to be. Who do we owe our lives? Jesus. Jesus, God. What you owe, let me ask you, do you pay? What you owe, do you pay? Mm -hmm. When it comes to what Jesus has done for us, are we paying? We ought to obey God rather than man. If it comes down to the governments wanting to take the church, wanting to take our bank accounts, they can have all that. But the government will not take our faith. The government will not take our boldness. And the government will not take the fact that, that you put me in prison and I'm going to find some souls to help get saved. Mm -hmm. I'm still going to speak about Jesus. You're not going to take my testimony. You can take everything else, but you will not take my testimony because my God has commanded me to testify what he has done for me. Mm -hmm. That's where the line is drawn. And that doesn't mean that as a church, if the governments turn against us now, oh, let's get a militia and let's get our guns and let's shoot everybody down and kill them because we need our, you know. There might be those out here that, are, that will do that. And although we might be cheering it on, we still, that's not our place as the church. Our, our, our place for the church when, that th when those things start to occur, our place is to look to him for the next move. That's right. Whatever we're going to go under, he will direct us through it. Did Jesus fight when they came to get him? Mm -hmm. He submitted. And that's what basically we have been commanded to do as well. Now, there might be times when we have to defend our families we may have to be part of a militia if they're trying to come in here and take the women and children and rape them and kill them. And, you know, that's different. But if it's just uh, our freedom to preach and our freedoms to, what, to do what we're doing, hey, you can take everything. You can even take my life. But you're not going to take my testimony. And I will continue to let my light shine until you put it out. And even though you might put it out, government, guess what? You might put it out, but my light's going to shine brighter up there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's the attitude we have to have. Now, what's my time, babe? I don't have my watch on. Okay. I think we'll stop here because actually this next question goes right in hand in hand to the, the, to the tenth question. So we'll stop here. Um, but that's, that's where we draw the line. We talked a lot tonight we're supposed to respect the governments and even when the governments don't respect us we still respect them but there is an area where we will draw the line when they take away our ability to testify and to witness and to speak in the name of Jesus that's where we say no we will obey God before we obey you you know so 
We'll stop there. Any questions? Okay, well, if there's no questions, we'll close with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your word. Father, there's no... There's no areas in life where we're confused because when we look into your word, almost every aspect of our lives can be found in those words. And we understand your mind. We understand your heart. We know what you expect. And we're just praying, Father, that you will help us to conform to you. Help us to conform to your purpose and will. Help us to conform, Father, to the things that we need to conform to. And we're just praying, Father, for a Holy Spirit revival, yes. first in our hearts yes. and in our church and in our community, Father. I'm praying that you break down these strongholds here in the Sacramento area, Father, with so much uh, evilness and so much disregard for your word and all this uh, uh, demonic activity being done through drugs and how it has enslaved many of the ones that are on the streets. Father, I'm praying, Father, for a revival, that the Spirit will begin to, to change hearts and we'll begin to see miracles in these people's yes. lives and that their souls will be saved, Father, before it's too late. We also pray, Father, for all the, with all the corruption and all the nastiness that's right there in the legislative buildings here. I'm praying, Father, that you'll put conviction on some of these people, convict them of their wrong, Father, help them to see where they was wrong, help them to get on their knees and repent, Father. And may there be a revival, Father, of the Holy Spirit in all aspects of our community. Uh, Father, I pray for the needs of those that are here tonight. Uh, we have a mother, Father, who's praying for her son, and yes, he may be having to face the district attorney with questions. Give give that young man the right answers, yes, Father. Lord give Jesus. him a, a, a spirit of yes, wisdom. Yes, Clear up his mind so that he yes, can fully Lord. answer correctly and honestly yes, all yes, the questions Father. that's presented. Yes, yes, if he has to go to court, Father, may he not do anything <coughs> to perjure himself, yes. but may he give a forthright testimony, yes, Father, yes, that will help yes, determine yes, what has Lord. taken place. Yes, Father, I pray that you'll bless that house, that you'll yes, help that house, Father, yes, in many Jesus. ways. Let your Holy yes, Spirit Lord. reign. Yes, I pray, Father, for our sister over here and all the things that she's gone yes, through. Lord. Father, I know many times she's weighed down emotionally, but I pray, Father, that you lift her burden yes, and you Lord. give her peace. I pray, Father, for, for this house. I pray for my wife, my children. I pray for the situations we're encountering, the, the job stresses and all the things, Father, that we go through. I pray that you give us the mind of Christ in order to deal with these. And when we're faced with a dilemma, we'll take the time to seek you and find out what it is you want us to do. Bless our efforts, Father, for everyone that was not here tonight. Yes, for Father. those who wanted to be here and who who are not here, for those who may have forgotten to be here, yes. whatever the circumstances, Father, I pray yes, you Father. touch them, that you bless them. Yes, Give them, Jesus. Father, a desire to get online and watch yes. what we've done, yes. for this Jesus. will be online later. Father, I just pray for an anointing of your Holy Spirit yes, to fall. Lord, I pray for every soul who listened tonight online. I pray that you touch them, that you yes. protect their homes, Thank that you, you bless Jesus. them. And I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit yes, will be the guiding light in all of our lives. Yes, yes. Bless Lord, us, appoint us, anoint us, and <coughs> give us the right direction. Yes, Lord, in Jesus. Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen.